Now, Professor Kirk Smith, who has been actually working also on the field extensively in India on uh, the Indian LPG program, Globally Pioneering Initiative. Professor Smith made a presentation here in August in this conference room exclusively on what on his findings and then we went on to invite him to write this chapter for us. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm going to tell mine in a little bit more personal mode. I mean, uh, India and I share uh, a, a common birthday, actually. So uh, I won't reveal my own age, but you can read it up there on the, uh, on the uh, poster. Uh, I'm not going to take you through all 70 years, but 35 years ago, halfway through both of our ages, uh, you know, I conducted some research here in India, actually in Gujarat, in Kedah district, uh, that for the first time documented the severe uh, air pollution that occurs inside villages. Everybody had thought of air pollution, as we, many people think of it today, as an urban phenomenon, as an industrial phenomenon, that it only relates to, um, you know, cities with poorly controlled uh, power plants and industries and vehicles. Well, that is important, as we all know, who live here in Delhi. But actually, as we heard earlier, the biggest health effects in India uh, seem to be occurring in villages, and that's because of the use of the traditional chula that's burning biomass of various kinds, the cow dung or um, wood or crop residues. And um, we did that first study in Gujarat and that opened up the world, the, the eyes of the air pollution community in the world. And since then, there have been, I dare say, a thousand studies, good proportion of them in India and, and Nepal, but also in Africa and Latin America and China and, and you know, Thailand and all around the world. We now realize that this, uh, health, this health effects from this exposure inside village houses is one of them is probably the single largest environmental health uh, risk factor in the world you know perhaps uh, depending on where you are dominated by outdoor air pollution the two of them together are the biggest single risk factor for ill health in india this is rather unique in world history i don't think there's ever been a country that's had those two forms of air pollution together being the single biggest risk factor for ill health now, this, you know, India has, you know, developed to some extent, but still has a lot of, you know, malnutrition and um, problems of poverty, plus, you know, the problems of overdevelopment or obesity and uh, hypertension and so forth. But nevertheless, air pollution in its two major forms, outdoor and indoor, let's say, um, is the biggest single risk factor. Now, um, it's twice the burden of disease per capita per capita than in China, for example. So it is a major issue for the country. If the country is become going to be healthy, if the country is going to be productive. Uh, very important issues beyond uh, you know household fuels. It has to improve the situation. So what's happened? What was the situation in when, when we first did the first study 35 years ago, actually in 1981? Well, there were about 700 million Indians using solid fuels, as we call it, uh, biomass. Let's say for cooking. What's happened since the early 80s? Well, India's developed substantially. You know, I mean, you go to villages now. In fact, I went back to the same village that I worked in in 1981. Very interesting experience. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm still alive. Maybe some of those women are still alive, and indeed we found them. Um, they have cell phones, of course. They have satellite TVs. They have motorbikes. They have uh, pukka roads. They have, um, you know, mostly pukka uh, mostly uh, clean water and sanitation available. They have um, um, you know, it's much development, but they're all still using chulas. So we started to look into this. So there were 700 million people using chulas in 19, about 1981. Um, how many today? Remember all this big development in India that's occurred. Well, as of the beginning of 2015, an important date to consider, there were still 700 million. There was no progress. Now, many more people were using LPG, clean fuels. You were all using clean fuels. All your grandmothers were using biomass, I can guarantee you. 95% of um, India was using biomass in the, in the 1950s. No, probably all your grandmothers. 
all you view transited to clean fuels. The growth of clean fuels in, in the form of LPG has been 5% a year. Not bad, I mean, overall. But it hasn't been enough to let the poor, to penetrate down into the poor populations. So, I mean, we wrote a paper, we called it the Chula Trap. 700 million people caught in the Chula Trap. So development is occurring, and they're sitting down there still every day in these very smoky houses. So um, that's until 2015. Or, you know, to be honest, again, like somebody said, the, the early initiatives actually came in the last government, but the Modi government just took off with this thing and developed three major programs. The Paul Hall program that allowed the subsidies to be much more highly um, focused on the people who deserve them instead of people buying, you know, getting two cylinders and selling one to their brother-in-law who has a restaurant. That's not completely eliminated, but greatly reduced. Deposit the subsidies directly in people's bank accounts. The, uh, the biggest, the first month that happened, it was the biggest bank transfer in human history. And it must be bigger each month, I guess. Uh, so it must be breaking the record of each month. A major accomplishment. It didn't actually help the poor directly, but it, by targeting the subsidies, making them more effective, mean, making you know, breaking this sort of the standard economist argument is well, the subsidies are a waste. I mean, they just get wasted. They're used for the wrong things. They don't help the poor people you you want to help. Well, that's you know not so true any end anymore. And then the second thing happened, the Give It Up program, which we heard about. A brilliant idea. We don't think of subsidies now as, as necessarily kind of a drag on the economy and something to be embarrassed about and politically difficult to get rid of. You know, Egyptian government fell, literally, when they tried to get rid of kerosene subsidies. So you ask people for it. So 12 million households have given it up. What a brilliant idea. You know, I think this idea is so brilliant that other countries should take it up. They're, I mean, my country has a lot of middle-class subsidies that people don't even know they have. And if you could have them give them up and go to something that they felt was beneficial, and one of the brilliant things about the Indian program was that you can go on a website and you can see your name as somebody who's in the scroll of honor that you've given up your subsidy, and the name and address of the poor person who got it. That's the brilliant side of it. Nobody wants to give their money back to the government. Well, that's for sure. But if you give it to something that means something. Everybody in India knows about poverty. You know, they may ignore it in day-to-day -day life, but they know about that poverty out there, and this is a way to help. Now, so that, that was a major thing, 12 million households. But the Modi government, you know, began to realize that 12 million wasn't enough. They weren't going to get, the, you know, everybody to give up their subsidies. And, uh, you know, that's just too much to expect. You can still give it. If you haven't, you should give it up. It's uh, you know still possible to do. Easy to do, too. You can just sign up with your cell phone. So they started the Ujwala program, which actually directs government funds to um, uh, poor popula uh, to the poor, the BPL originally, and now this new um, category of um, SCCC, um, to get the upfront costs of getting an LPG connection with a goal of 50 million households. So 12 million or so from the Give It Up campaign, 50 million from the Ujwala campaign, they're going to have 60 plus million households by the, not, you know, by the time of the next election. Um, no, that's 350 million people. This is a very big program. It's the biggest in human history in, the, in, in, you know, in my narrow field. But it's not a narrow field in India because the health impacts are so great. And then there's so many other advantages to um, clean fuels, you know, the saving of time of women, the, the upgrading of the status of the kitchen and a whole range of things. And, you know, and it, this, none of this could have, could have happened 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago, because of the development of what people call digital India. Now you can have jam, you know, the the bank, uh, electronic bank accounts, the Aadhaar card, and the mobile phone that makes all of this much more efficient. So you might say it took a long time to develop all of the elements of this, the recognition of the health effects, you know, that came out of our research, or the, the impact knowing that now these, uh, this, this pollution is causing a severe amount of ill health. Oh, I should also mention that an additional component of that that we are, are now pinning down got a new paper coming out shortly, is that that household air pollution, as we call it, those, those chulas burning. Well, what happened? I don't, I don't actually use the term indoor air pollution anymore because it may start indoors, but it goes outdoors. It goes next, next door. It goes in the bedroom. It goes down the street. It becomes part of general outdoor air pollution. 
Of course, 170 million households burning dirty fuel three times a day, it's going to cause a lot of outdoor air pollution as well. Well, how much? Well, estimates vary. Our first estimate was 26% of outdoor air pollution in the country coming from households. A group out of Harvard came, had a paper, they said it was 50%. Well, our new paper, which I think is much more, uh, you know, uh, much better scientifically, is estimating 29%. I don't care what the number is, but it's a big number. You cannot solve and is serious outdoor air pollution problem when you've got people burning dirty fuels in their households every day. So it is cleaning your own environment as well as helping the, the poor clean their environment. So it is, a, you know, we all, in a sense, all India cooks in one kitchen. You know, the smoke may not be coming from your kitchen, but it comes from somebody else in that kitchen. So, um, now, um, I want to get at the same point I think other people are making is, um, no, I don't know the details of the politics here, although I have been in the country 95 times, beginning to learn, but the siloization that is going on. Uh, you know, it's not just the Indian government. Every government is siloed. You know, my university is siloed. Everybody's siloed. So you have to break... You know, break this up. And, you know, maybe the Modi government uh, can try to do this. And wh why, do, why do I hear it? Well, I think the Ministry of Petroleum, you know, which has done a very effective job in the Ujwala campaign, is going to deliver 60 million households by 2019. You know, they can, they can do some things, but they can't do others. I think you need to engage the health ministry in this. Only the health ministry can push the usage. They're going to connect 60 million households. But many people, they connect to the LPG cylinder is sitting in the corner. They make tea, you know, when their sister-in-law comes over, but it's not a big part of their life. Pushing usage is what the health sector knows how to do. I have a lot of experience. I'm a health scientist. What, how do I mean that? Well, you can give people condoms. What good does it do as they sit in the drawer? They have to use them. You can give them bed nets. They have to use them. You can give them institutional facilities to deliver their babies. They have to use them. You can go down the list. You can, you can give them no salt, low salt foods. They have to use them. It doesn't, providing it is, yes, important. But usage is equally important. And that really is not something the Ministry of Petroleum can do well. That has to come out of you know, the kind of social pressure, the local interactions that the health ministry has. There are 900,000 ASHA workers out there working at the local level. We work with them in you know, our, our research sites in Maharashtra and, and, um, and in uh, Karnataka. This is a really uh, important asset for the country. And they're working with preg every pregnant woman in the country. They're le guiding her through the system and uh, making sure they deliver in institutions. The, the cash incentives to, for women delivering in institutions is, is a revolution. Almost no woman now delivers at home anymore. Why is that? Well, there's a recognition of the benefits of delivering institutions, but I tell you, it's the, it's the 2,000 rupees that the woman will get that makes the difference. So conditional cash transfers, conditional on behavior, cash transfers directly to women, only to women. Why is that? Well, you know, much less likely to go beer and cigarettes if it goes to the woman in the, in the family, I'm afraid. This is another lesson that's come out of this. So, you know, a conditional cash transfer to pregnant women as the next phase of the Ujwala program, I think, you know, we can eventually reach, you know, the full, use, uh, you know, maybe 120 million households that we need to cover to meet the STD goals. You know, I think India has a chance to meet the, SD, uh, the, you know, the UN goals of 100%, not really defined, but full use of clean fuels by 2030, but only because of the Ujwala program. So I, I'll just get back. So India was, you know, 5%, middle class was getting its clean fuel. Now we're at 9 or 10%. So we're actually on a, on a trend to um, beat this problem in the country. But I think the next stage, personally, has to be jointly with the health ministry or, you know, maybe the state health departments, but nevertheless, you know, with the health sector. And that pressure, I know, I think it's going to have to come from the PMO. That's my conclusion on this. So thank you very much. I think it's a, Professor Smith, it's a fascinating account. Your chapter describes what I have, what I keep referring, since you used it, now we keep referring to it, how a large segment of rural Indian women have been liberated from the Chula trap. And when Prime Minister says, in fact, in his presentation uh, in August, he had given a detailed presentation, when Prime Minister says that this is the amount of smoke equivalent to these many cigarettes, 
that they inhale is not just making a political point. It's not even a political point. It's a deep health point that he's making. And when you're talking about transforming India, unless you liberate and empower and transform this segment, this vast segment, there's really no transformation that takes place. So I'm really uh, very grateful that you've taken the trouble to, and uh, I think we need to keep this discussion going on. And perhaps every time there's something, there's something that we scale, we need to again bring that into the narrative. So thank you very much, Professor.